Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to give a talk here. Um, I guess so. Uh, so one remark in being recorded is I, I think uh, I, well, you, you could argue against being recorded because you could make mistake. But if you go in the line of Douglas Adams's uh, reasoning, so at the beginning of one of his books, he decided to write the story of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and how it came to be. And in it, he decided to set the record wrong for et eternity. <laughs> so, to get, so that's what I plan to do <laughs> for the rest of the talk. But maybe it's not so wrong. <laughs> Number 42. Unfortunately, there's only 25 slides. But <laughs> OK, so for dispersive PDEs, uh, waves uh, travel at different, uh, or with different uh, wavelengths, propagate at different phase velocities. Uh, and so they tend to disperse. If, if you have an unbounded domain, they tend to disperse out. And so for a typical equation, dispersive equation, like the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, uh, this, can, this dispersion can be translated into decay. So this is the L infinity decay you get for the 2D nonlinear Schrodinger equation. For compact domains, you don't have such a decay because things get wrapped around, or a boundary that they bounce off. And for such uh, domains, one expects a energy cascade to occur. Okay, and so this is actually a subject of a famous conjecture of Bourguin, who conjectures that exists uh, solutions to the nonlinear Schrodinger equation whose high Sobolev norm grow as time goes to infinity. Okay. Uh, another way of looking at this uh, is in the context of wave turbulence. So wave turbulence was born out of an uh, attempt to adapt the ideas that Kolmogorov applied to hydrodynamic turbulence to uh, uh, nonlinear decoupled uh, waves. And so this is an example of <laughs> wave turbulence. It's always, uh, it's always, uh, so this is a dangerous thing about getting recorded because someone will point to me and say this, this picture has nothing to do with what the talk is about. But, but, <laughs> but anyway, so the, but, but the idea here is that the, you have small little ripples and we want to describe the sort of randomness of these, uh, of these waves, of these small little ripples, as opposed to hydrodynamic turbines where you have things going everywhere and everything being crazy. OK. So let's fix this uh, in a mathematical context. So take a solution to the nonlinear Schrodinger equation on the torus of dimension d. And we consider a torus where the lengths of the torus are of a size L. Because in the end, we're going to use this as a scaling parameter, and we're going to take certain asymptotic links, uh, limits. And one of the limits will be in terms of this L. Now, this is a little bit of notation, uh, which I need. Maybe I'll write down, since it comes up all the time. So I call this, so I have this uh, sigma. Uh, k, k1, k2, k3. Uh, and here we have, this is just k minus k1 plus k minus k3. And in every iter iteration of our papers, we design, decide to change the sign notation, which is always fun. Uh, and this is already a mistake because I went from a different slot different uh, version of this talk. So k, k1, uh, k2, k3. Uh, this is going to be, uh, so q is uh, going to be our dispersion relation. So q of k minus q of k1 plus q uh, of k2 minus of k3. And q is our dispersion relation, k squared. OK, that's enough notation for now. 
So using this notation, we can rewrite the nonlinear Schrodinger equation in Fourier space uh, by the following. Okay. And here I've modulated out the uh, linear dynamics. And lambda sigma. Big so? lambda sigma. Big lambda is, ah, oh, that's one of the one other ones I didn't get to do. Because in one, one paper we had, we had <laughs> lambda and I tried to find all, um, but I missed that one. <laughs> I think we decided to change lambda to sigma because we have lots of lambdas. <laughs> You'll see another lambda, a lowercase lambda appearing here. <laughs> so, okay, so there's a lot before, there's a lot of caveats about this slide. There's a lot wrong about this slide. No, the previous slide is nothing wrong, right? No, th this slide, no, other no, than this no, lambda here, yeah, yeah, there's no, nothing wrong. That. <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing wrong. Okay. And this slide, there's a lot wrong. Okay, uh, not because I wrote it wrong, <laughs> but because yeah. So this is sort of a uh, so typical sort of way. If someone, if a physicist was describing uh, wave turbulence in a cafe, uh, this is how they might describe it. That's not to say this is what they mean. If you like really like dig at them, they'll they'll bring out the details, and you'll. I actually understand what they really mean by these things. But this is sort of the cafe description of wave turbulence. Okay, so you take, you introduce this lambda. Uh, so I already introduced this lambda. It's, lambda is just introduced to scale the size of the data, so you can rescale the equation. So you take lambda to zero, and if you take lambda to zero, it you uh, restrict to exact resonances of the equation. You take L to infinity, and then you go from a discrete sum uh, to an integral. And then you apply the appropriate statistical and time averages, and you magically arrive with this equation. Okay. Now, this equation also doesn't make sense, even by itself, as a standalone equation, because I, s I set rho k uh, to be the expectation of a k squared. So this is not even closed as a real equation. It's just to give you an idea of an equation. <laughs> so it doesn't, the equation itself doesn't make sense. And also it doesn't really make sense to say, just take L, uh, lambda to zero, L to infinity. You have to take them in the right way. What else is wrong about this? Uh, there's also, uh, you, you do not restrict to exact resonances. That's just wrong. Okay, when you... So the exact resonances means you put in the omega, delta omega number, right? Yes, so that, that's where these are... Uh, that, that, this, is, this is where it comes up with the restricting to exact resonances. Now... Why, why, why were you saying this wouldn't be a closed system? I mean, like, you mean one over rho k is the expectation of one over one over... I mean, it's, it's rho in terms of rho, and rho is time defined in terms of the expectation of something. Ah, okay. okay. So, <laughs> so we don't have any evolution of A, so it's not, in a, clo it's not a closed system. And yeah? If you take lambda to, to zero, and the right-hand side will go to zero, maybe you have to rescale this. You, you, you need to res this is This lambda sticking out the front is another thing that... Another problem, <laughs> which will uh, even sending lambda to zero is like it's all. Th there's a lot of problems, okay? And I'll explain. I'll I'll overcome all the problems one by one, okay? So the the whole idea of this project was to come up with a, you know an equation that makes sense and a regime that makes sense where everything is mathematically rigorously defined, okay? And this will, and if you actually restricted to exact resonances in a you know two D or three D system, you wouldn't even uh, converge correctly because there wouldn't be enough of them. And in general, you shouldn't expect exact resonances to play any major role because you could change the domain slightly, you and you'd have no what exact resonances. Are, but, uh, sorry, you haven't said what exact resonances. What you mean by exact resonances? Yeah. So I mean in the original equation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I mean. Uh, 
Yeah. So I, I mean when this omega is zero in the in the in terms of the original nonlinear Schrödinger equation on the torus. Uh -huh. And that might look reasonable because you have a lot of T. Yes. Uh, but yeah, it it's not going to be enough. Uh, but it, it, but uh, also, if you just change the domain such that there's very l you can't really solve the equation, there's very few solutions to that thing. Then it, of course this wouldn't describe much at all. But I, I'm going to explain what actually how this can be made, how this can be corrected. And I'm not saying that physicists think this way. As I said, if you dig them, you know, dig at them for a while, uh, then they, you know, little things little gems come up and you, you realize what they're trying to say. Okay. Okay, so let's start with a heuristic temp attempt to derive the kinetic wave equation. So this is like a bridge way between the mathematically rigorous one and the sort of physics explanation I gave before. So let's take initial data uh, which is given such that it has, an, uh, initially it has a random phase. Okay, and we also uh, normalize the amplitudes such that the L2 norm is, is approximately 1. And then from a simple large deviations estimate, you get this scaling for any LP norm. So this comes from the random phase assumption. So the phases are random, but, but, but phi k is not random. No, they're deterministic, exactly. They, yeah, the, any, you can pick any phi k so, so the, this property holds. Okay. So we're not restricting that. Okay, so now let's write the solution a k as a Duhamel expansion. Okay, so we write it in terms of its initial value, and then we do a du first order Duhamel expansion, and we get this, and then you get the second order, you get the third order, fourth order, and so forth. Okay, for this calculation, I will need at least two orders. Okay, I only wrote down one just because it's messy. Using the random phase assumption, we can restrict interactions. So we have the ex expectations of this product uh, uh, is on only non-zero uh, if, if these k's are permutation of these l's. So, so when, you're, when you're doing a Duhamel expansion, you're doing a power series in lambda? Uh, or what? I'm just uh, integrating in t time. So I'm just integrating in terms of, I'm doing a Duhamel in time uh, in terms of the initial data and I take the differences between. So I'm just uh, using the equation. There's, there's a Dyson iteration that you can do. Uh, and I'm just wondering, is that just go back to the equation? So I'm just integrating this, okay? And then, and then, I'm, uh, and then taking this and then integrating this, taking, okay. taking this equation. Taking the integral of this and recur doing a recursion on this. Yeah, yeah that's what I'm doing. Yeah. Okay, so. Okay. So if I do that, then, and I set rho k to be the expectation of a k squared then the first order terms are the initial data plus this term here, okay, plus higher order terms. Okay, here I'm just, I used that a bunch of terms cancel uh, because of this property here. So you, are you just going to go second order for purposes of this talk or you, you must have to go higher order? Oh, I go to, uh, right. go to uh, arbitrary higher order, but this is just for the heuristics. I'm just saying that there's a dot, 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 and then later I will have to deal with that dot, dot, dot. <laughs> okay, so now I take... So, uh, if you're just, if yeah, sure. You, uh, just could you back up for one, one slide? Uh, so, so this is the average that you're taking now of, yes. of, of the AK squared. The yes. The perturbation scheme. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so the, this second term... Uh, uh, this I should say the second term. So the the there's a term in between which disappeared. Uh, this second term comes from uh, uh, so the 
uh, this interacting with itself and also the second order term interacting with the zeroth order term. And if you do all that, you get that that's where this term comes in. Okay. Now, if I take uh, L to infinity and I correct this slide, uh, so, <laughs> so there's a missing a sign, this sign squared should appear here. Um, then you can imagine you can replace the sum by an integral. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a big caveat about this, but it'll come in. And where's your coupling constant gone? Um, the which constant? Lambda m. Uh, it has, I just deleted it and then I said that the inner, I just said that this part uh, converges to this part. Yeah, so I should have put the... the, the, the yeah, yeah, there should be a lambda out here and there should be a lambda out here. On the, the, the prefactors have disappeared. Okay, so... No, there should be an L there, absolutely. <laughs> if I include the prefactor, it... it, it yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, so now, the, the thing that I'm missing also, the final step I need to do in this heuristic derivation is replace this by a Dirac delta on omega. And uh, so if, if I take t to infinity, I haven't said how I t take these to infinity. They t go at the same time. So you can't really do this. But then if you do that, then you get the kinetic wave equation given by this. And I'll write the kinetic wave equation in terms of this uh, math called t. Okay, and tau is going to be the kinetic wave, uh, the kinetic, the, uh, the nonlinear time scale. So this is the time scale that you expect an order one change to occur. So this is an important thing, so I'll put this here. So tau um, equals lambda, it's uh, yeah, L to the 2D on lambda to the 4. Okay, uh, with a 2 as well, but I'll forget about that. Okay, now that's just a heuristic thing, so it's, it's a little bit better than what I had before. in which you have order one, uh, order one change occurs. So this is, so this is the, the solution equals its initial data plus something. And if for this to be order one, compared to the initial data, t has to go to tau. So tau... Uh, and, and tau is getting large. No. Yes, tau is getting large, yeah. Okay. Yeah, tau, tau will get very large. So instead of considering uh, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation on the torus, we'll actually consider the nonlinear Schrodinger on a, on a generic rectangular torus rescaled by L. What I mean by generic rectangular torus is you take a torus and you change the side lengths, uh, you set the side lengths to be a, a certain uh, number, and I'll, I'll, uh, and I'll, I'll explain generic just in a little bit. And, and then once you have that rectangular, so you can imagine having irrational side lengths, for example. Once you have that uh, rectangle, you rescale it by L. Now, by the rescaling of the equation... The previous, the previous, uh, in the previous slide uh, was sort of an intermediate type of derivation. Right? Yes. Okay. It's slightly more rigorous. Now, now we're getting more math. Than that. Now we're getting to math. We're, we're sort of getting from, from very heuristic to Exactly. Now, now we ha now now we're at the, the math sta stage. Okay. So, uh, so now, if you rescale the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, you can uh, you can take this. You can go from the. You can write this problem on the generic torus in terms of the regular torus by rescaling the Laplacian. So you just replace the Laplacian uh, with uh, generic, putting generic coefficients out out the front of the derivative. And by generic, I mean that you take these coefficients, say in the range from one to two, and the, 
th the result that we'll prove will hold on a subset of possible better of full measure. And the reason why you want to do this is, uh, is because exactly if we go back to the, this, uh, this is really wrong. Okay. And we want to kill as many exact resonances as possible because the exact resonances give you completely the wrong time scale and you just want to get rid of them. Okay? And you want to replace them with quasi resonances. And so you need an equidistribution result, which I'll talk about uh, at the end of the talk. And so that's the purpose of switching to a rational torus or a generic torus. Okay. So this is our theorem. Okay. We consider the nonlinear Schrodinger equation on a 3D generic torus, rescaled torus, so rescaled by uh, L. And we assume the initial data satisfies the random phase condition. Then there exists some delta greater than zero such that the following holds. Now, if lambda is less than L to the 9 on 53, <laughs> uh, so this, 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 num the weird, this weird number comes from the fact that we we use some strict arts estimate, which is not quite sharp. If you had the sharp estimate, you could get a better result. Uh, then we have that the, these, this is the uh, same as rho k. The expectation of a k squared is given by the kinetic wave equation. OK, now it's still for a very short period of time. It's much less than the uh, nonlinear time scale, but we show that the solution itself is actually described by the kinetic wave uh, equation. And what I mean by that is that its evolution, it does get evolved by this, and the next order term is strictly small. Okay. So at the end of the talk, I'll talk, you know, it would be nice if you could, you know, push this further and push it to longer time scales where you could actually get the nonlinear time scale. We can't currently do that. But what we can do is this is the first mathematically rigorous derivation of the kinetic wave equation. Okay. Now, I said a lot on that uh, physics of the slide was wrong. Another thing that was wrong was that we don't really need lambda to be small. We don't have to take lambda to zero. It's not, lambda is not the like, right quantity. Uh, the right quantity is actually lambda times the L infinity norm of u. So this is comes from, right it's the potential has to be small. So if the potential is small, then uh, you can justify uh, weak turbulence. That's the real scaling. So there was a, it is sort of a smallness criteria, but it's not in terms of lambda. It's actually in terms of the size of the potential. Potential? I mean, this is like the, the potential, if you think of it as a potential here. Yeah. Okay. Yes? So why this particular? Uh, L to the 2.65. Because this is actually a <laughs> really <laughs> important number. In, no, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's, this number is greater than two is important number. Yeah, so we, we get better results than you would get from the, uh, from the f that you get for the rational torus because you get a lot of cancellations because you don't have exact resonances. In the rational torus, you'd get like L squared on lambda squared just because of the dynamics of the resonances. That's the resonant time scale. But since we're considering a generic, uh, a generic re rectangular torus, we're able to kill a lot of those resonances. So we're able to go further than we could for a regular rec rectangular torus. Maybe what you were saying. Your big T is much smaller than tau. Yes. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. So we're not able to reach the nonlinear time scale, but we're able to show. But, but, the next time, but the next correction is even smaller. Then, but we're able to show that it actually satisfies the, the, the yeah. equation in the sense that the next correction is, is smaller. Yeah. yeah. And in the rest, in the ordinary torus, which I think was your earlier paper, 
Yeah. yeah. We didn't get the kinetic wave equation at all. And uh, it's, it, the, there's a problem about, okay, the, the, you can actually do it for the rational torus. You can do it in a, you can do a different uh, scaling regime in which the kinetic wave equation makes sense in the rational torus. And this is a new result of, well, it's an unpublished result by someone that hasn't announced it yet, so I won't <laughs> announce it. <laughs> <laughs> Alleged result. There'll, there'll be a result. Not by, not by me, but a result. So, uh, okay, so now let's uh, actually carry it. Uh, ca let's, let's do this heuristic derivation, but actually uh, carry it out rigorously. So, we first do a first order. Um, expansion of AK. Uh, so if we just integrate the equation for AK, we get uh, this equation where P3 is a mononomial of degree 3. And then the idea is we just integrate by parts several times. So if we integrate by parts another time, then we get now a mononomial of degree 5. And we get these uh, factors uh, coming out from the, uh, from the oscillation factor and from the integration by parts. We're just doing this straight standard. Uh, uh, standard yeah. Duhamel. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and so where I, I should point out this, this, the next few slides is all following sort of the work of uh, Lucan and Spohn. So there's this uh, fantastic res, uh, result in 19, where they, in 2011, where they dealt with the discrete NLS, so the NLS on, on a, a discrete grid, and they're able to, uh, you know, able to come up with um, effective equations uh, in the right regime, but I won't go into all that. And they use, they build this whole machinery which deals with these Duhamel expansions and we will need it. Okay, and it'll be, so yeah, so now if we keep going, so we integrate n times, we end up with AK written in terms of the initial data plus some remainder. So this uh, J n, uh, you know, consists of uh, a, a number of uh, mononomials of degree 2n plus 1, and they're generated, so n means that we've done n integration by parts. And the, this L is just used to keep track of the history of the expansion, so how the mononomial was generated. Okay. So this is a typical uh, uh, tree. So here we so this L3, so this time we've, we've done three uh, integration by parts. The L3, so L3 says which term uh, we expanded on. So here, so th the three is the depth, and one, two, three is, one, two, three, four is just uh, identifying the different term, uh, the different wave vector. And so here we expanded on the first one here, uh, we expanded on the third one, that's why we have L2 equals 3. And here we expanded on the second one, that's why we have L1 equals 2. And I'll explain what these omegas are. So it's, it gets really complicated and it really helps to draw out these diagrams. So this is why Feynman diagrams are useful. And we'll see. We'll see that. So now we first note this simple identity. If you have some sort of integral like this, then we can rewrite it in the following form. And if we define uh, Tj in this form, and we define these uh, phases and by here, then we can get an explicit formula uh, for these, um, these JNLs, which appear uh, in the, which appear here in this sum. So it's somewhat complicated, somewhat complicated, but it's, uh, so this is this using the identity above. These are the, the AK coefficients. I have the sigma, which, is, uh, which refers to the parity, because in the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, you have conjugates, so you have to keep track of all the conjugates as you go along. And yeah, so you get this horrible formula, but it's a formula, okay. So 
that's one Feynman diagram, or is it all of them? You've so I've just written one of them, yeah. One, this is, this is, this is yeah. Just one, one, Feynman one of them, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And now I want to, okay, so now if we follow the same thing in the <coughs> heuristic section, then what I get now is that AK squared becomes these interactions with these MathCal J's. Uh, and now we get the, the, if I use the first, the first and second order expansions, then I get the kinetic, the thing that's going to become the kinetic wave equation, and I get some sort of error that I have to deal with. Okay, so the whole, whole hard task is dealing with this. Okay, and the main technical estimate is the following. Uh, so we, uh, if you take the expectation of one tree with another tree, uh, then we get this following estimate. Now this is a bit better than the trivial estimate that you'd expect. So the trivial estimate you expect just comes from, uh, from counting. So we first have this prefactor which comes from this. We have the measure of the time uh, integration <coughs> is of order t to the n plus n prime. And we have the summation of k, k prime has dimension 2n, uh, n plus uh, n prime plus 1. And you also get half of these are cancelled by the pairing and the dimension and d dimensions are cancelled uh, by this, uh, by this restriction here. And if you add those, you add this all up, you get this trivial factor. So we get an improvement of roughly 1 over t plus this logarithmic factor. Okay, and this is what allows us to close and show that this, these yeah, second. The factor, one over t is, yeah, yeah. Really important. It's really important. If we didn't have it, if we just had the trivial thing, we wouldn't be able to deal with this last term. Yeah. And this comes from, this is not, this is a, you know, a lot of work in which th this comes from using uh, the, adapting the work of Luca and Mishpon. We do this something slightly differently, like we have a bunch of sums that we know how to um, bound differently because we're using number theory and things like that. But the, the brunt of the, of the machinery comes from Luke and Mishpon. So you don't need any of the heat brown stuff or that kind of stuff in this work or not? Oh, we need number theory. Oh, okay. Yes, Come. but we need Borgan. Okay. <laughs> heat brown is not enough. He, oh no, he's a lot. He's he's <laughs> he's is great, but we need stuff by uh, by a paper of, um, uh, by Boga. Uh, so so the proof comes from you. You have to divide things up into different possible interactions, and the easiest way to do that is 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 drawing out a bunch of diagrams. So you take two trees and you try to pair them, and you have to pair uh, the parities. So a plus has to go with a minus each one. So this is roughly saying that the uh, that this wave vector is the conjugate of the other one and and you just have to pair them. And you see different types of different types of uh, pairings and then you can use that and in order to come from the average and over, over the randomness. Exactly. Over Taking the, the expectation. Yeah. Then only, only ones that have opposite phases will Exactly. Be so it comes from the it comes from comes from the fact that we made this random phase assumption from the very beginning. Uh, so it comes exactly from this. Okay. Okay. So once we've thrown a lot of machinery at this problem, let's throw some more. And so now that we have, okay, so the last step is to go from a sum to an integral. Okay, <coughs> now you could just say, well, isn't this just uh, a Riemann sum? The answer is no. Uh, so if you just fixed, say, t and you took L large, then you could say this is just a Riemann sum that we need that uh, t uh, times l to the minus uh, 2 uh, grows with l. And so in such a regime, it doesn't, you, you don't get a Riemann sign. And the reason why we need this is that we need that this sign converges to this Dirac delta. And this is, this is the requirement for this to be true. Okay. 
So now we get into the heavy number theory part. So, uh, so in order to obtain an asymptotic formula, uh, we adapt um, a paper by Bocan, which so on pair correlations for generic diagonal forms, to our setting. Um, so, uh, I, so first, I won't give you the argument. Uh, to, it's a short. It's all Bocan's papers are relatively short, but incredibly dense. Um, but it's a, it's not a long paper, um, but it, you know it involves a lot of like really, kind of great ideas, uh, and I'm not going to go through those ideas because it's a bit complicated. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, and he got basically the uh, the optimal result. I think if you, yeah, if you write it, you might, you might have to change something in his paper, but you basically get the actual optimal result from this, from this, uh, from this method. So I'm not going to go through the uh, entire proof of Bogan, but let me just give you some intuition. Let me get, do an easier problem. So instead of finding an asymptotic formula, I just want to do a lower bound on these sums. Okay, and so you can roughly translate the sums I had before into uh, uh, sums of uh, finding the cardinality of sets like this. So Q is your quadratic form. Just to clarify, uh, before we had the fifth, uh, or maybe the, we had the integral product, which was a rational quadratic form, and then you were using some serious number theory on certain things. Then I was now using Heath Brown. So, to tell you how to go about uh, doing this... Yeah, because it's an indefinite quadratic form. Yeah. He's looking at how often that takes values in the integral yeah, exactly. box. And that's the, the problem that we try to use in the irrational way. It's called the Oppenheim graph. Yeah. Uh, the difficulty was to solve it with few variables when the basis are irrational, not with length. Then even random. But, but that's yeah. the point. You've got to make yeah, you have to make a quantitative, yeah. Otherwise. Absolutely, you need an asymptotic formula which just gives you off at the Heimlich construction. So the, the, the real recipe to doing all this sort of stuff is getting to a number theory problem, having no idea how to do it, and then going to Peter and asking him <laughs> where to look. And so this has happened twice. In our last paper, we, we asked Peter and we got the right paper for Heath Brown, and this, this paper, Peter pointed us to the... With a high probability, I can always say okay. Okay, so okay, so we're uh, attempting to to bound uh, so differences, uh, so these uh, on these uh, differences, uh, these these ir uh, these quadratic forms here. So when this qu the quadratic form is in some interval from A to B. So, uh, you have to you have to see how far you can go down. So that's you, you, the optimum. You know, it will depend on there will be a certain relation with L. Yes, in, in which this is you have. So this is the whole problem. So you want to take A and B very small. Okay. So you claim that the estimates that John has are real optimal for this. Uh, I can't remember if he stated the optimal result. But the argument gives the optimal result. The reason why it gives you the optimal result is kind of uh, there's trivial um, there's trivial solutions to the uh, trivial uh, solutions to these uh, uh, um, tri trivial solutions to this uh, inequality, <laughs> and, and th those trivial solutions uh, you know are, are, have a certain size, and that's how you can see that it's the optimal result. But I can't remember if he stated it that way, but but uh, in any way, the argument itself does give you the optimal result. So, okay, so let's consider the much, e this is much far easier problem of just bounding uh, the size of such a set. And so let's consider instead, uh, 
let's start with linear forms. So this is the first ingredient. So you start with sort of these linear forms where you just take beta dotted with n and you want to bound the cardinality of n uh, in some range such that beta dotted with n is within this range from a to b. Okay, so in genericity you have uh, this, uh, this property here which is just a diaphragm approximation inequality and then uh, using that if they're different you can use this to get uh, um, so if it satisfies this and this bound if you apply this then you get this inequality here and then finally you get a bound using just the pigeonhole, inequality, uh, pigeonhole principle so you get this bound here now let's consider these uh, sets RZL. So I changed the um, I changed the condition slightly such that I made L corresponds to to setting all the the last uh, pairs equal to each other, and then I'll just sum over all the RZs Ls, and then I get the uh, the bound on the original RZ. And how you do this is you just uh, rewrite uh, K. Uh, you yeah. So you rewrite this as um, um, as different uh, as you know P, pi minus q. So you just rewrite the the, the difference of squares. Um, and in doing so, you can reduce to the linear forms. Okay. So you can just uh, yeah, um, yeah, so you reduce here to the linear forms in this sum here. You're, you're sketching and the now, I'm you're sketching the Bourdain proof? Or no, 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 this is, this, is, uh, this is just the simple proof. And this is the whole proof, it's not a sketch. Like, this is, there's nothing more to it. Okay, this sum, uh, this is, you know, just a simple uh, divisor bound you get. This, uh, you can bound this sum here from the previous bound, and you get this bound here. Okay, so a very <laughs> quick summary of, of how to actually Bogan's argument work works. This is much more delicate. What you want to do is first you take uh, the set and you want to split it up in different blocks. And then you want to throw away the blocks that you don't want to deal with. And you make sure that the stuff that you throw away doesn't have, have a lot, isn't very big. So once you've thrown away that, then you apply the Fourier transform to isolate uh, the leading order term. So this is similar to a circle theorem argument but slightly different. Um, then you apply a Chebyshev averaging uh, on the coefficients. And then there's one final tricky sum that you have to deal with which uh, is dealt so with. What, what you did you just this, sum of this, this last bit was a Exactly. And this, this last bit bit has been used in many problems since. So this la there's a tricky sum that you get in the end that you apply the Mellon transform conjugate integration and some bounds in the zeta function, the critical strip. And this, uh, you know, there's a lot of work to get it up to this, but this is one of the really, I think, key new ideas that Borgan had. I mean, you might point out that because the form's indefinite, yeah. the quadratic form, the basic indefinite quadratic form is x squared minus y squared. And if you factor out that x minus y, x plus y, Exactly. That's that. That yeah. That's also a key. Uh, yeah. So you can't quite do the same thing for um, for all quadratic forms. You have to use it. You have indefinite quadratic form. Um, and I. So okay. So uh, going towards the future, uh, what what are the open problems in the area? The big problem is to get to the nonlinear time scale. Uh, in which an order one change happens. And it's possible that if you reach the nonlinear time scale, you may have to, you know, ha have to add a correction. It's very possible that this is the case. And so, uh, you know, a big question is what that correction would be. And then you can ask other questions uh, such as can you apply this to other compact geometries? Since it should be sort of generic for any geometry, it doesn't, shouldn't necessarily be a torus. 
Exactly. And the organic result is already enough for the non-linear sum theory. Which, which result? Oh, the number theory is fine. The number theory is as good as you know, you'd want. It's, it, that's not the restriction. The number theory is not the restriction to getting to the nonlinear time scale. The restriction is the remainder term. Is the remainder term. We have to deal with the... Find my diagram special. Absolutely. Well, you can you can change. So the thing is, <coughs> this this th this the the way that we did things is uh, there, there's actually a lot of regimes in which that this all converges. So you you can go to certain regimes where the number theory isn't so important. You don't have to have such precise bounds. We get a really long time scale because we can. Uh, use this number theory, but there's you can even, in the right sense, do this with a, uh, with a rational toro. It's a different regime, it's a different scaling with the lambda and L, um, but you, you can do that. Um, but also, this whole um, setting gives you a basic setup to go about applying this theory to other equations and really testing when this theory, in what regimes this theory makes sense, because it doesn't make sense in all regimes. You can't just take uh, lambda to zero, L to infinity, and hope for the best. Uh, you really have to uh, figure out the, the, the correct scalings uh, in order to, uh, such that this kinetic wave equation appears. It does not appear in all regimes. It only appears in certain, reg in certain regimes. Uh, so I will, I think I'm a bit early. I just realized it's, uh, I have till 5.15, but anyway, it's late, so. 6.15. 6, 6, <laughs> <laughs>